want to get started, uh, the call to order the uh, City of San Carlos Successor Agency to the Redevelopment Agency Housing Authority regular meeting of November 26, 2018. Would you please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you. Uh, changes to the order of the agenda. Um, does anyone have any? I was thinking maybe we should move, just in case uh, there are probably some people here, um, if we moved 8C to, uh, and, and just um, swapped it with 8B, is that all right? Just move, go A, C, B, is that okay? Yeah, fine with me. All right, we'll do that, because I think there's some people that are here for 8A possibly too. So I'm looking at, uh, yes, at least a couple of people. All right. Um, so we'll make that change. Uh, report from closed session, Mr. Rubens. There's no report tonight from closed session, although you have a related item on the open session tonight. Okay. And presentations. Um, first is welcome San Carlos School District Superintendent Michelle Harmeyer to uh, San Carlos and receive an update on the school district. So Michelle, you want to come up? Thank you. You have two minutes, Michelle. <laughs> kidding, 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 Michelle, kidding. Kidding. Thank you, Mayor Grisilli. Take as much time as you need. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Members, for inviting me today. And uh, Mr. Maltby, nice to see you again. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I came tonight not just to introduce myself, but also give a little bit of a district update, too. Hope that's okay with you. I'll, I'll zoom through a few different items. But I did want to um, just start off by saying thank you, because it's just uh, nice for me to come to a city and start off with a good partnership with my city partners. And I wanted you to notice my pin because I am a graduate of the Citizens Academy. I got lucky when we first moved in here, um, my husband Brian, who's here, wanted to find a volunteer opportunity. He went online, he found this program and signed up. And he said, by the way, you're going to. So it, it were, that was just what I wanted to do for eight Wednesdays in a row when I first got here. But I'm really glad I did, because I got to meet everybody and got to know the city very well. So thank you for that, and thank you for having this program. Just a little bit about background about myself, just so you get to know me as an educator. This is my 26th year in public education. I've been in kindergarten through eighth grade, all through in several different districts. Working backwards, I just came from Anaheim Elementary School District, a very large urban district with 18,000 kids, kindergarten through sixth grade, in the happiest place on earth. Um, wasn't so happy though for everybody, but it was a very good experience to really work in an urban setting uh, and with the, the challenges that they, they serve there and what a wonderful education program it was. So I had a, a great learning opportunity there. Prior to that, I was right here in San Mateo Foster City for a few years. I was a director of human resources and worked under Cindy Sims and, uh, now, and then Joan Rosas, the superintendent there. Prior to that, I was in Marin for a year just as a one year as a principal as I was working in my doctoral program before I got recruited to San Mateo Foster City. But prior to that, I spent 20 years in Roseville. And Roseville is in Placer County, just east of Sacramento. Very fast growing area in Northern California where the city of Roseville had a model master plan since the early 80s and built its parks and schools all together in partnership. So I was able to be part of the opening of three schools, one as a teacher, one as an assistant principal, one as a principal, and each time partnering with the city as we opened a park adjacent to us, which also, of course, had adventure club daycare and uh, other partnering amenities and facility use agreements. So I, was, I would like to say I grew up uh, in Roseville as an educator and really saw a great model of a city working closely with the, the several school districts that were within the, the city bounds. I also just um, want to give you a little background, um, a little introduction to my team. Uh, you may be aware, but just in case you're not, we had a large change in leadership this past year in the school district. Uh, Superintendent Baker relocated and to Cupertino. By the end of the school year, uh, we had five out of eight principals um, positions that needed to be uh, replaced, and our whole cabinet team essentially was a new cabinet team. So that's a very big change in such a small school district, but I wanted to introduce my team to you because they're new uh, in the community as well. Hans Barber, he is our assistant superintendent came from the Santa Clara area, also in Cupertino, and uh, oversees our education services and our human resources departments. 
Jennifer Smith, our Director of Human Resources, has worked 10 years at the County Office of Education under Sue Weiser as her assistant in human resources, so comes with a lot of experience. Mila Milligan is serving as our CBO. She was our Director of Finance for the last several years after coming from Burlingame and took over for Robert Porter, who retired as our Chief Operating Official. And that's Brian Olden, my husband, sitting next to them. He's, uh, he's a volunteer. He's a volunteer. <laughs> But I did want you to, to get to know our team since we all are new, so you have some familiarity with all of us. Uh, a for, few little updates for you. We just had our academic um, update with our school board on um, October 18th. And there are lots of different ways to measure the success of a school district, but one of the things that we know is important uh, are the state test scores that come out every year. And I'm proud to report that we are uh, continuing to grow and perform at a high level, but we are one of the highest performing districts in California and also here in the Peninsula area. So we have our very high achieving um, school district, very proud of that. Not only are we serving the academic needs of our students, but we really focus on their social, emotional well-being, physical fitness, um, arts, STEM, and all of those related um, activities. So we really are focusing on the whole child, but we're also very proud uh, that we are um, achieving very high uh, levels for our area. And it makes a difference when parents are looking for schools and neighborhoods and where they want to live. It's one of the first things they do is to take a look at that data. Uh, another update is our building project. We had a general obligation bond, a couple of them, as you're aware of, probably in the last several years. But we just completed our, our bond work that started 2013, and that was Measure H. So we uh, completely remodeled Central Middle School and added a new school on its campus called Arroyo. That's the fourth and fifth school sitting on the campus. Tierra Linda had lots of upgrades and improvements to it. The Charter Learning Center is now complete. They have their own campus on the, on the uh, facility of Tierra Linda, and it's a really interesting, innovative model using shipping containers, uh, which did cause a little bit of a delay, but, uh, but at the same time, it's a beautiful model of an interesting modular program. And our fifth graders are just about ready, uh, fourth and fifth graders are just about ready to open the new Mariposa School on that site also. So right now our fifth graders are there. Uh, the fourth graders will move over next year from Arundel and Heather. And then we'll have our eighth school opened up next year, and that's Mariposa School. They're, they're not official yet, but we do have a principal, and it is called Mariposa. But uh, they'll have a new CDE number, and they'll be official next year. During that time, the, the district office was also relocated down to Industrial and Howard, so that was part of that bond work and giving the central office a, a home base to be. And also, the last piece are our elementary schools. They had some work done to them during the early stages of the bond work, but they are part of phase two of the facility modernization. So we have four schools that need a lot of infrastructure work, but that'll be at a later time. So right now, what are we doing with facilities? We're really just focusing on deferred maintenance uh, for those schools that are, are aging and need plumbing and electrical and HVAC and all of those things and just trying to keep them patched up right now until we can move forward with the next modernization phase when that does come. We're exploring future options for maybe a possible bond in the future to take care of those modernization needs, but we're also um, exploring options to finish the last piece of construction for the Mariposa School. We'll be able to open up the school next year, but it didn't completely finish. We still have a, a large learning commons building and some refresh um, to do on that, on that site, so we're looking at some funding options to finish off that project. Our Smarty After School program, we, we offer lots of um, options for families outside of the regular school day. Um, and there's three things that we do with our enterprise program. It's called Smarty. And we have a preschool program, which is a, a, a paid program, not part of the school district. We expanded that program. We have two preschool classes at all four elementary schools now. We have eight classes. And that's providing a very much needed service for our community to have preschools uh, conveniently located. And we're looking to expand that program, hopefully a couple more classes uh, next year. We also have after-school enrichment classes uh, through Smarty, and this year we have asked an outside company, Kids to Pros, to manage all of those enrichment classes. So there are lots of different choices that people can take an hour or two hours after school, and for a lot of people that's the only care that they really need, so they sign up for those kinds of classes. And we also have our Smarty after-school and before-school care, 
um, call that our extended day care. So there's some morning and afternoon supervision and care. We're having a lot of challenges with that program because of our labor shortage. And we also struggle with facility space. So we are engaging our community in some discussions about that program as we make some plans for next year to see how we might modify it or change it a little bit so we can try to accommodate as many people as we can. But at the same time, we want a high quality program that's safe for students as well. And lastly, uh, we have a budget advisory committee that we're uh, hosting this year for the first time in a while. I think we've had to have some budget discussions. Our state funding has leveled off. And in past years, we've been growing as a district. And when you grow, the money comes with kids and you are in a, a good spot as far as your budget goes. And also the state was recovering from the recession and those funds were starting to come in. But we have now leveled off. So our income is not going to increase. However, our expenses are increasing. We have increased pension costs, as I think you might be dealing with here too, that are really encroaching into our general fund. So though we're not getting more funding, it's like a, a budget cut because our bills are increasing, our expenses are increasing. And at the same time, we had 100 children not show up this year. That did not come through the door as anticipated. Uh, happened to many of us around the, the Bay Area, the high cost of living we feel is the main cause of having a lot of people leave this area that can no longer afford to live in this region. So with 100 students leaving, we are now going to experience a reduction in, in revenue. So we're gonna have to just make some adjustments and do a little belt tightening and, and uh, we're using this budget advisory committee as a process to essentially develop our budget in front of the community of a diverse set of stakeholders, teachers, administrators, parents, and uh, we've even asked a, a couple of the members of um, Mr. Maltby's team to join us as to see if we can partner in unique ways too. So we'll be essentially building our budget all throughout the, the school year. So those are the updates. I didn't know if you had any questions for me. Uh, Mr. Olbert. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, appreciate that, a great introduction. Good seeing you again. Um, uh, the, the only question I have, and it's probably more like uh, uh, indicating something I'd be interested in being kept apprised of by, by your team is as um, uh, experience and insight grows as to why the enrollment's declining, I know you, I, I suspect what you said is probably the answer, but I would love to know that because that actually has implications for civic policy as well on a lot of levels. Um, and so I remember when you first mentioned that to me, I think it was you know some, some weeks ago when we met, I was like, hmm, okay, that's definitely something worth following up on. So I would love to be kept in a loop on that. We will do that. And it's a, an important concern for us too because we are projecting we need to make sure that we have room because there's a little dip. We know they're going to be coming. So we need to be planned for that, but we'll definitely keep you up to date. Michelle, thank you so much. Appreciate the uh, information. Also meeting the staff that you have. And uh, again, welcome. Great to have you. The next item on our agenda is a presentation of a proclamation to Donna Beck upon her retirement for Healthy Cities tutoring. Yeah, you have to come up, Donna. <laughs> Not like Phil Donahue where I'd walk into the audience and go like this, so sorry. Is this on? He said. Oh, it is. Yeah, great. So. Um, I've known Donna for, I guess, at least 13 years, if not longer. And um, Donna was, uh, uh, how can I say, mentoring, <coughs> mentoring healthy cities through the city. And then Donna wasn't mentoring healthy cities through the city, as we all had a um, difficult early part of the century. Uh, and the city had to make some very uncomfortable and very difficult uh, cuts. But that didn't dissuade Donna because she just stepped over to another side and made sure that Healthy Cities has grown uh, exponentially, in my mind, uh, in, in the past, I say, ten, what is it, 10, 12 years? How many? Tw tw yeah, it's 12, 12 years. So um, I'm going to read a couple of these whereases, but uh, uh, over the past 21 years, uh, Donna Beck has guided the Healthy Cities tutoring program from inception as a city service into a thriving nonprofit organization with a commitment to ensure every child has the support necessary to achieve their full potential. Healthy Cities Tutoring has expanded to serving all nine schools in the San Carlos School District, plus four schools now in Redwood City. 
Can Belmont be next? I don't know. Um, whereas during her tenure, she oversaw all development of, development of all aspects of the organization, including recruiting, training, and matching volunteer tutors with students. How many volunteers do you have now? 404. 404 volunteers, and how many students? 469. 469, unbelievable. I mean, just unbelievable how this shit's grown. I remember it seemed like it was just in the in the hundreds, if if that, when I when when it started. But anyway, uh, coordinating tutoring services in each of the schools, fundraising, and leading the board of directors and staff, and creating an intergenerational community-wide volunteer program. I know I'm not a volunteer, but I know many volunteers, and they range from uh, teenagers all the way into people in their 80s, if not 90s. I, I remember. So it's a, it's a terrific organization. Um, you know, whereas, 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 uh, you know, so on and so on, people can read it. But the point being is Donna has, do has given this city an amazing amount of time, effort, and, and, and support to, to help the young people of our schools. Uh, and and as, as Michelle uh, indicated, the great school district we have, part of that is this group, Healthy Cities, which helps these young people learn. So uh, congratulations, Donna, very much on your retirement and well earned. So. and for this honor, much appreciated. And uh, many of you in the audience have, have made it all possible. Uh, Leslie Loomis is here, the person who hired me back in uh, 19, December of 1996. We were much younger then. <laughs> and, um, and it's just grown as, as you've outlined, but because of a lot of people in this room who, who volunteered and stepped forward and helped me, um, the staff and the volunteers, and. Um, have all the board of directors and the teachers and just everyone. It's just been a true community effort to make it all come together. So I'm really honored and touched to, to receive this and, and thank the council for being part of it, the city being part of it for so many years in the school district. And um, we, we have um, many more children to reach and I, I know we're gonna continue doing that. So thank you. Okay, the next item on our agenda is to uh, receive an update on the San Mateo County Mosquito and Vector Control District from Ross Graves, San Carlos Board of Trustees. Ross, what, what's happening to your audience here? <laughs> no, seriously, if folks have to leave, please, please go ahead, Ross, before you start. We'll let them clear. I'm, I'm used to it. <laughs> <laughs> He's not carrying any mosquito virus. He doesn't have any of that. So. Okay, Ross, why don't you go ahead? Welcome, by the way. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council for the opportunity to give you uh, uh, what I hope is a brief and, uh, and, and periodic updates on the important work that the Mosquito and Vector Control District is, is doing. Um, I've been serving as San Carlos trustee for six months now, and after 25 years in the corporate life science field, I can, I can tell you how impressed I am with the operation and management of the district as well as the science-based approach that the district takes um, for all decision making. Uh, I'd like to uh, give the bulk of my uh, five minutes for the, uh, to give the presentation to our public health education and outreach officer, Megan Sabai. Welcome, Megan. Thank you so much for making time for us. I promise to be brief. 
Uh, the first thing that I want to talk about is the 2018 West Nile virus season. West Nile virus is a potentially very serious disease that's transmitted by mosquitoes. Um, statewide, there were 182 human cases and eight fatal cases here in California. I'm proud to report that here in San Mateo County, we had zero human cases. In fact, we only detected West Nile virus once um, over the summer in East Palo Alto, and we were able to quickly get that under control. Um, the season has since ended. We don't expect to see any more West Nile virus in 2018. Uh, we don't expect to see any more until next spring. So we're pleased with that. Um, in addition to our ongoing work in San Carlos as far as managing mosquitoes, um, we got about 200 calls from your residents during our last fiscal year. That's July 2017 through June 2018. Um, about half of those were calls for yellow jacket wasp nests. We provide that removal free of charge. It costs about uh, between $75 and $150 if you pay a pest control company. So residents are understandably um, very pleased to, to take advantage of that service. Um, Mosquito calls were down, not just in San Carlos, but countywide due to us getting a new data management system that really improved our program last year. Um, and requests related to rodents are also down considerably um, here in San Carlos. Um, we've gotten a lot during the previous two years, um, but we think that residents are getting a better idea how to deal with that, although roof rats are really an ongoing problem throughout the peninsula just because of our environment. Um, we've been doing a lot of rodent control work in this area. Um, you know, we've been working both with the city and with individual residents. Um, there are a lot of things that residents can do to help reduce the risk of having a rodent infestation in their home. Um, the most important one is to work together with their neighbors. A rodent infestation isn't something that occurs at one household or on a single block. It's something that occurs community-wide and it really requires a community-wide solution. Um, so we're happy to do anything we can to help residents work together to make those changes, to make their properties a little bit less hospitable to rodents um, and hopefully improve that situation some. We provide trainings, presentations, inspections, um, pretty much anything residents need to get that under control. Um, and the final thing I wanna make sure everyone is aware of is that unlike most of the United States, we have our major tick season in winter here in San Mateo County. Um, these are the numbers from last year, and I have this circled in red um, so that no one mistakes this for 140% or 14%. It's 1.4%. We have a less than 2% um, infection prevalence of the bacteria that cause Lyme disease in adult deer ticks collected here in San Mateo County. I know that under 2% does sound like low risk, and compared to a lot of places it is, but low risk does not mean no risk. Um, so we'd like to encourage you and everyone in this area to take precautions if you're going to be spending time outside. And finally, I wanted to make sure everyone understands how they can request any of these services from us. Um, we have a website. They can give us a call. They can email. We're happy to help any resident of the county. Um, any of our cities, they can be homeowners or tenants, it doesn't matter. Um, and we can even take requests anonymously. If there's something that someone sees that they think might need attention, we're happy to take a report and send someone out to look at it. Great, thank you very much for the report. Yeah. Uh, I have a couple of questions, I guess. Uh, Mr. Albert. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, nice presentation. Um, just two questions. One is, uh, uh, in terms of uh, risk exposure to the pests, is, is what's the impact of uh, climate change anticipated to be? There was actually a, a new report released recently. Um, what we're hearing is that climate change is going to potentially increase the risk of vector-borne disease in the United States um, through warmer temperatures and the expansion of the range of some of these disease vectors, including ticks and mosquitoes. So that's a major concern for us here in San Mateo County. Um, warming weather could uh, potentially reduce, increase our odds of having invasive Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, which were seen in Menlo Park in 2013 through 2015. And that's something we're very, very concerned about. So a key takeaway is we, one should not anticipate that the future will be like the past. That is absolutely correct. 
Um, second question probably is more of a, a Jeff question or certainly a staff question. And I just am curious on our city website, how straightforward is it for residents who perhaps have, and they may not know they should be contacting the agency, to go from, hey, I have an issue with rats, mosquitoes, whatever, to get linked through to where they're supposed to go? I'd have to take a look. I don't believe I've ever actually had occasion to go on to that particular web page okay. on our on our city site. Uh, for what it's worth, it's, I know this everything falls in this category, but given the nature of the risks here, it might be worth uh, making that making sure it's reasonably straightforward. We'll check it out. Thank you. We'd be happy to talk with your webmaster or your outreach staff. Collaborate. We'd love that. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much for the report. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ross, for serving. Appreciate it. Okay. Thanks a lot. All right, uh, next item is public comment. This is for items, uh, persons wishing to speak on items not on the uh, uh, current agenda. Usually each speaker is limited to two minutes. I have one card. John, do you want to talk on this area? John Hoffman. John Hoffman, resident on Crestview Drive. Uh, I've appeared before you before, uh, and this is one more effort to impose a two-term limit. The U.S. Constitution has been changed to prevent the president from running for more than two terms. The people of California wisely made that same determination for their Congress, or for the Assembly and for the Senate, as well as the governor. Uh, all of the uh, commissions that uh, you charge are limited to two terms. I think it's well beyond time that the council take that in hand and limit themselves as well. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, John. It's the only card I have. Is there anyone else wishing to speak on items not on the posted agenda? Okay, we'll move on then to item seven, which is consent calendar. Consent calendar items are usually uh, uh, formulated in one motion. So do I hear a motion? Mr. Mayor, I move to approve City Council consent calendar items A through L and item M, adopting ordinance number 1538, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of San Carlos, amending ordinance 1394, amending the development agreement between the City of San Carlos and the Palo Alto Medical Foundation for Healthcare Research and Education relating to the development of property at 301 Industrial Road, APNs 046-051-020 and 046-051-070 to extend the vesting period for 10 years. Is there a second? I second. All right. Mr. Sir, Mayor. Yes. Before we vote, I, sure. there was one item I wanted to pull off and okay. deal with separately is uh, 7E. I believe it is the uh, contract for planning. All right. So uh, Mr. Olbert, would you amend I'll your amend motion? I'll amend my motion to okay. remove item 7E. All right. Um, <clears throat> a motion, is there a second? I second. Okay, motion and second for the consent calendar A through D and F through M. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, roll call please. Councilmember Collins? Yes. yes. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Obert? Yes. And Mayor Grisselli? Yes. All right, um, why, don't you, why don't we take this now? Go ahead, Matt, if you have a question. Or yeah, the question I have is what's the um, overall plan here with the contract? because we've extended it and mm -hmm. added to it and so forth. And okay, Mr. Walpy? Uh, so uh, I believe last week or the week before the uh, RFP was put out, so we'll be going through a, a full RFP uh, process for the council to be able to consider. We, you know, it'll, it'll close in a month or so the, for the response period, then we'll evaluate, present to the city council and they can select uh, the next vendor of that particular service. So this is just a, a fixed several yeah. months to close the gap so we don't lose planning coverage. Very good, thank you. Okay, could I entertain a motion for 7E, please? Mr. Mayor, I move approval of item 7E. I second. All right, moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Obert? Yes. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. Mayor Grisilli? Yes, all right. Moving on, um, 8A, new business, consideration of adopting a resolution amending the dog park hours and improving additional off-leash dog locations. Ms. Newby.
Good evening, Mayor Grisilli, council members and members of the public, Amy Newby, Parks and Recreation Director. I will begin tonight by providing background information on the pilot off-leash program, which began in 2012. Two fields, Flanagan and Stadium, were identified for the pilot program to allow dogs to run off-leash. The program limited the times of day in which this was permitted and the times throughout the year fluctuated depending on school breaks and the sports which were scheduled on the fields throughout the year. While the program was well received by the dog community, there were challenges that came with integrating off-leash dogs on existing and scheduled sports fields and the shared use with sports organizations and other recreation programming. Sports groups had concerns over the feces that remained on the fields within the playing area of the kids. Our park maintenance staff had to address the field conditions in the concentrated areas where dogs were allowed to be off leash. The program ran for several years before terminating in 2014. <clears throat> Following the termination of the program, several other park locations were considered for an off-leash dog park, including Upper Arguello, which is a flat area above the park near what's referred to as the Rocks, Lower Vista, a flat area of the park below the landscaped spaces, North Crestview and Chilton, parks, both unimproved park land, and City Hall Park, which was identified as an underused park space in a centralized location. <clears throat> After much consideration, City Hall was chosen to be the site where dogs were allowed off leash. Council approved funding for perimeter fencing and other minor modifications in early 2015. The modifications to City Hall Park were completed in the fall of 2015 and it opened to off leash dogs. Since its opening, several park improvements have been made, which include removing approximately three inches of the existing topsoil and replacing with a decomposed granite and a dust stabilizer, relocating the entrance gate from Elm Street to San Carlos Avenue, installing a dog and human friendly drinking fountain donated by the Parks and Recreation Foundation, and installing a few dog agility pieces, a project that involved two high school juniors from Sequoia High School who chose these improvements to fulfill their CAS project requirement, which is part of the International Baccalaureate Program. Current hours of the dog park are Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. and Saturdays from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. The park is closed every day for an hour for our maintenance contractors com to complete scheduled work, as well as on Sundays, holidays, and during inclement weather. This past June, council requested for the dog park hours and locations to be brought to the Parks, Recreation, and Culture Commission for discussion. The item was introduced and discussed at the August 8th meeting. 30 community members attended and many of them shared their comments and suggestions. 23 of the people who commented asked for more hours at the dog park and or more off-leash locations, preferably on a grass surface. Three of the people who commented requested not to increase the dog park hours. The item was brought back for further discussion among commissioners in September, and after a lengthy discussion, the Parks, Recreation, and Culture Commission recommends the following. First, to maintain the total weekly hours, so therefore reducing the hours on Saturdays from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. to 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. And add hours on Sundays and holidays from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. So shifting those Saturday afternoons to Sunday, Sunday and holiday afternoons. The commission also recommended to allow dogs off leash at Vista Park and Upper Arguello. Although North Crestview was also thoroughly considered for additional off leash, as an additional off leash, off -leash location, excuse me, the commission in the end did not include this site in their recommendation. And although many commenters requested more locations and more hours throughout the week to meet the needs of a growing community and to be more compatible with schedules of working individuals and families, the commission chose to spread out the hours, the same number of hours over the course of seven days as opposed to the six days. So with that, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Ms. Newby. Um, Mr. Collins? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Johnson, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I just have one, or I have one sort of general question, which is, um, does the city council need to set the hours 
um, for, for the parks is, well, it's based on the observation that like, every time we wanna make a one hour adjustment or add more hours or remove hours, it, it seems like it's you know a multi-month process. Um, is, is there an option where we delegate that responsibility to staff or we delegate it to the Park and Rec Commission? I don't know if this is also a question for, for Greg maybe, um, but is, is this the case with all sort of hours of public facilities that they always have to have a hearing before the city council? They, they don't. I think um, th this particular park, um, and my understanding is that we, we've, uh, at, at the staff level, decided that it was appropriate for the council to make the decision uh, on this after the review of the commission. But technically, under the code, the park and rec director has uh, broad authority over the parks and the use of the parks. So, so is it safe to say that under current law, the park and rec director can change the hours without the city council weighing in on that. Yes. I guess I would, um, well, we can talk about it more under the discussion time, but I, I, it seems to me that um, giving the staff the flexibility to work with the community and make changes and experiment and see what works best might be the wise thing to do. Um, one last question is, can you, can you help me understand the logic of shifting from nine to one on Saturday and then one to five on Sunday. Is there any concern that that would be disruptive to people who today go to the park on Saturday afternoons? And is there any reason why you don't have sort of a consistent schedule on the weekends so that people know, hey, if I'm taking my dog on the weekends, I know when the park is open. It seems potentially to be disruptive and confusing. Um. From the start of the conversation with the commission, there, um, they all agreed that they wanted to remain the total aggregate hours within the week. And so they added up the hours, the current hours, and then in the end, their cha their change was to take four hours from Saturday and add them on to Sunday. Um, from the public that came out to comment, requesting additional locations and additional hours throughout the week to accommodate really busy schedules, um, I could see how taking four hours off of a Saturday um, could affect people's weekly or weekend routine of taking their dogs to the park in the afternoon if they have other morning commitments. Um, and the commission did want to just balance the availability on the weekend of a morning time and an afternoon time, and they split it. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Olbert. Thank you, Bob, thank you, Amy. Um, I have several questions. Um, first off, um, how well does the process of closing the dog parks work uh, on any given day? I'm sort of probably thinking mostly on Saturdays currently. Um, and, uh, do, does staff ever have a problem with people not wishing to leave the park and so therefore having to exert some kind of greater level of suasion to get them to go or, or what? Um, occasionally, and I've heard from neighbors maybe once or twice in the last six months, maybe a year, that there have been people in the park when it is closed. Um, in terms of the routine, um, the gates are unlocked and locked by our maintenance contractors. Um, if we were to add Sunday hours, we would have to look at that because we don't have any maintenance workers on schedule on Sundays. So we'd have to look at our procedure and modify it. Um, and I'm not aware of any incidents between an, a contractor or an employee getting into any verbal disagreement with the park user. Okay, I appreciate that. The, the reason I asked, by the way, it was, I am a little concerned about the point Cameron was raising as well about having uh, inconsistent hours on Saturday and Sunday, and particularly when they're sort of a change, and I can sort of see somebody showing up, uh, you know, on Saturday at 1 p.m. saying the park's closed, and people are like, what? And, you know, what do, do, does the person, does the staff person then have to escort them out or, or what? So I'm a little leery about that. Um, the, uh, um, another question I have is at Arguello. Arguello, unlike um, Vista Park, has a combination of, of uh, non-field playing areas and field playing areas. How are we going to keep, if we sort of say, well, there's an off-leash area up here, mm -hmm. how are we gonna keep people from creating the same kind of problems that we had when we allowed the dogs off-leash at Burton, for example? How are you gonna keep them from going there? 
Um, that's a concern that I've already had and just kind of brainstorming signage that we could include on the lower field of our Guello, making it very clear that this is not the off-leash location. Um, and if you're familiar with the two, the field area and playground and the upper area where um, I'm talking about, um, it is very separate. And so there may be enough of a separation between the two areas that it won't be as of an issue. Um, but we do have issues with many dogs off leash in all of our parks. Right. And, and, and I, my concern is that actually sort of uh, authorizing partial use of the park for it, I think may very well just make it worse. Um, last question, um, uh, I recall from when we, we set up the city hall dog park, uh, fairly quickly um, it, it became, uh, there, there's a maintenance footprint to this in terms of keeping it clean and organized and whatnot. Uh, particularly, again, in the case of Arguello, but even, even with Vista, uh, we're sort of expanding the footprint of places that are gonna have to be taken care of. Um, first off, do we have any sense of what the cost of that's likely to be? And second, kind of related to that, was there any consideration giving, given to making the expansions to some degree contingent upon the organized dog owner groups in San Carlos volunteering to help keep the areas clean? Um, so the, the locations that have been identified to allow off-leash dogs, they're more of an undeveloped area. And so where City Hall Park is more of a developed dog park, these are two open space, not open space, but undeveloped areas, um, which both do include the dog uh, disposal bags at both sites already. And so maintenance will probably include just a daily monitor of that and cleaning up anything that is there. Um, I don't have a cost of that, but I could get that number to you if you're um, interested. And in terms of the responsible dog owners group in the community, um, I'm not in contact with them a whole lot, but every once in a while we do touch base. And when the topic came up of added hours and possible new locations, they do seem to be um, up for volunteering to kind of monitor the off-leash areas. Um, and I don't know how that program would look down the road and how much of a commitment we could get from the general dog community, um, but that could be a possibility to explore. The, the reason I asked the question about uh, particularly Arguello with keeping things clean is, is I tend to frequent uh, the Polgus Ridge dog park mm -hmm. because it has a beautiful 20 acre off leash area. Um, uh, it, it actually varies, but it at certain times of the year will have a significant number of dog poop bags, bags left all over all the trails. Um, and uh, it's evolved a little bit towards the better um, in, in recent years, but it is a concern of mine because it, it's uh, not all, I mean, to be perfectly frank, not all dog owners are as responsible as they ought to be. Correct. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Grocott. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions with the, both with Vista and Upper Arguello. Does that mean fencing is going to be introduced? No. No, okay. Um, and help me out with what you mean by Upper Arguello because you're correct, it's pretty well defined between the very upper part uh -huh. and the very lower part with the field, but there's a whole intermediary with trails? There's a flat area where Dartmouth and Northam meet. And so it's that area and it has the rocks and there's a picnic table. And so that would be the location that would be intended to have, to authorize and allow off-leash dogs. So how, how would that be made clear to the users that, look, you're not supposed to take your dog down below on, on the trails. And, and really what I'm thinking of, Amy, is when you, you go from the very upper part there's some trails that run down, and there is a, a rather level area with a, a because of the fire road, and mm -hmm. people go there to pick blackberries in the summer and so forth. Um, and that's before you drop down to the field. So there's this middle mm -hmm. level, and I'm wondering how you would make it clear. I, I assume that's not off leash. That area is so. correct, and it would just um, be us communicating that with signage and other means of communication and. Okay. S somehow with signage to say that and, it's, that yeah. or a map or mm -hmm. something like that. Okay. Um, and then the last 
the question I have is probably kind of prickly. Maybe the city manager or the city attorney might want to jump in on this. I'm concerned about liability because you've said now that there would be no fencing, which I can understand why you wouldn't want to put fencing. But on the other hand, if there is no fencing and a dog happens to run out into the street, um, and especially up on Vista, because people drive that, that's a pretty broad avenue there, and they go pretty quick, quicker than they ought to sometimes. Um, so a dog running out into the street or at both of those parks, uh, dogs be I interfering with uh, wildlife. Um, and, you know, obviously there's the less serious thing like getting sprayed by a skunk, but there's other kind of wildlife, especially the Vista, that is spotted up in that area on occasion, like mountain lions and, uh, you know, that sort of thing. So would the city have any live, open itself to any liability if something happened to someone's dog in one of these areas? Well, I, I think there'd be um, a pretty low risk of liability because our our code requires dog owners to maintain control of their animals, um, first of all. Um, so they have to have voice command of their animals. So if they don't have a trained animal, then it would be on, on them uh, in the sense that they did not have control and they were out of compliance with our code and our rules and regulations. Um, as far as the, the wildlife, um, I think we accomplish um, limiting our liability on that by appropriately signing the areas. Uh, if there is a, uh, I've seen, you know, at Polkus Ridge, they do have a warning sign uh, at the at the trailheads that there are there are mountain lions and coyotes and other animals that could be dangerous to your pets. I think so. We would follow that uh, basic protocol. I think for that. Thank you, <coughs> Mr. Collins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Amy, when we were deciding before where to put the, the dog park, which was what, four years ago or so, um, wasn't Upper Arguello considered at the time? Yes. And what, what was the resident feedback? Do you remember? I don't. I remember. <laughs> okay. Um, I didn't mean literally. <laughs> so, uh, and the same question for Vista Park. Well, did we not also consider that as well? That was also considered. And if we had adopted either one of those, would we have fenced either one of those areas? I mean, do I, you remember if that was in the plan? I know it's four years ago. I'm testing your memory, but uh, no, it wasn't. It wasn't. Okay. All right. Um, all right. That, that's all I had for now. Okay. So I had a couple of questions. Um, have we ever done a survey or have any knowledge of what what hours are really being used at the dog park at City Hall? In other words, do we have any concept of the fact of on Saturdays you have huge amounts from nine to one or <laughs> none at all, or, or is there any? I have not conducted any true time okay. number count on any day of the week. All right. Now Vista Park to me is a finished park unless we're talking about something else that I'm not understanding. When I say finished, it's got a lot of, you know, it's finished. Whereas North Crestview right now, it will be finished, I'm sure in the future, but it's not finished at all. Why wouldn't we have North Crestview be the open area and Vista not because, well, like I said, Vista's more of a, a finished thing where more stuff can sort of get, how can I put this, torn up if, if somebody goes in the wrong, or an animal goes in the wrong place? Correct, so Vista has kind of the upper area where we do have native landscaping right. and we did recently modify or renovate that with the master gardeners. Right. Um, and then it drops off and there's a lower area. And so the lower area is the intent of where off-leash dogs would be okay. allowed. Um, but you're correct in that Vista does have a part of the park that is considered developed and maintained right. um, where North Crestview doesn't. I mean, I, I have the same, it's the same conversation just that was brought up just a minute ago about Arguello. I mean, people, not that people get confused, but they could be. But, and why was North Crestview, I mean, I understand it's going to be, a, when it's finished, I wouldn't recommend it. But right now, it's wide open up there. I don't understand why the, why folks didn't look at that more or... What it is, that? and the commission discussed North Cre North Crestview significantly, and it was one of the um, more appropriate locations. And in the end, they just decided that with the recent master plan process, they wanted to leave that. Mm -hmm. And 
look at these other two park locations? Well, certainly in the future and, and probably in the near future, next couple of years, it would be probably have to be changed again because we'd close that part of it off because it's going to be fairly finished. But I'm concerned about, I, I guess I'm concerned about both Upper Arguello. I'm not as concerned, I, I, I'm not as familiar with Upper Arguello as I am with Vista. But just say the word Vista or say the word Arguello, I don't know if people are going to get the upper and lower, mm -hmm. uh, especially when they come off of Crestview, they just let the dog go and then, you know, it, 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 it may or may not make the bottom level. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, other questions? All right, we, uh, we have some speaker cards. So thank you, Amy. There may be some other questions that'll come up. So I'll call your name if you'd come up, please. Uh, Sandra Neff. We'd like to keep the comments to about two, three minutes at the most, please. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I've been talking to all of you for about three years now, so we have another discussion. I sent you pretty much what I'm gonna read about a month ago. So as you deliberate about the city dog park hours, I would like you to consider the following opportunities for dog owners in San Mateo County and beyond during Sunday and holidays. Number one, there are about 27 off-leash dog parks in San Mateo County, including Heather Park. Number two, there are several beaches along the San Mateo County coast that are available for off-leash dog activities. Number three, there are many miles of sidewalks and trails for strolls with leash dogs in San Mateo County. And number four, there are numerous off-leash dog parks in San Francisco and Santa Clara counties. So you can see dog owners have many other locations to take their dogs when City Dog Hall Park is closed on Sunday and holidays. The condo owners and the renters at the various buildings surrounding the dog park have only Sundays and holidays totally free from barking dogs. Barking dogs make sounds that are different from the moving cars, children playing, or other passing sounds, and those barks are piercing. I certainly hope you vote to keep the park closed on Sunday and holidays so all the people who live around the City Hall Park can continue to have peace of mind on those days. Thank you very much, and thank you for the re retiring council members for all your, your work that you've done. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Brian Papantonio, and I apologize if I put the wrong emphasis on that. Hi, I live at uh, 633 Elm Street, just across the street, and I have a dog. Um, the problem, I was here three years ago asking about the problem of uh, off-leash dogs on this street because dogs jump out of the car and they're typically off-leash. Um, I had asked you to address that and so far nothing has happened. No random enforcement, which shouldn't have been hard because this is the police station uh, and I have not seen any additional signage. And it doesn't seem like you've really done anything to address that. And now by asking to change the hours uh, to, do, uh, to add Sunday, you're inviting other people from uh, other communities even more so than before. So we're gonna have more new people potentially coming to the park on Sundays that could, couldn't have, have joined. Um, it's one thing to invite other people from other cities and you know, have them do what they're gonna do here, but now you're risking my safety because every time I go outside to walk my dog uh, on leash, of course, he's attracted, uh, there's other dogs that are attracted to him, they run up to me, I don't know what their intentions are. We don't, you know, he's, he's gotten attacked by other dogs before, he can be kind of skish. I don't know what he's gonna do. Um, he has gotten uh, attacked in this neighborhood before. Um, so you really should be uh, going back and addressing my original complaint that was three years old uh, before adding additional hours. I think more study is needed. And really that's all I'm asking for at this point. Just that problem was a serious problem then, it's a serious problem now. So that's all I'm asking you to do. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Carol Bonk.
Thank you, council members. Cara Vonk, 34-year resident of St. Carlos. Ron Collins and Bob Grisilli, I know well from the Planning Commission days. Um, I'm here to talk about the off-leash upper Arguello uh, off-leash area. My husband and I live in the neighborhood, and this area is a very beautiful, natural place to walk where one can commune with nature. And we are very uncomfortable of off-leash dogs. Um, some of us have been bitten by off-leash dogs in the past. And there are a lot of other uh, residents who like to hike up there and commune with nature. So I don't think this is really an appropriate place to have off-leash dogs. Um, although it's, it's a little different area, we did see a dog get attacked once. It was tied up to the uh, fence where the owner was playing tennis at the park, I mean at the school. And two large dogs attacked this poor little thing and I don't know if it survived. So having off-leash dogs, I, I think it creates a dangerous and uncomfortable place for residents who like to get out and commune and get our daily exercise. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Andrew Taylor. Council, Andrew Taylor, Crestview Drive, um, resident and dog owner. Um, I, th I will echo the comments, I think, from both uh, Mr. Olbert, uh, you, Mr. Garcilli, and, and uh, Mr. Grocott. In particular, as it concerns Vista Park, um, you get dogs, I don't care if they've got a voice command, they're under voice command, you mix wildlife with dogs and dogs on leash, and it's an accident waiting to happen. You've got the vehicles on Crestview. There are a lot of people that already use Vista both for picnicking, because you have the picnic bench there, for uh, just sitting and enjoying it. And I, I, this is just going to be a bad mix. Um, there's an off, I mean, that's our daily, twice a day with our dog is, is up from Crestview all the way up to Vista and back, and we do our loop. And there are a lot of dog owners, and everybody's on a leash. Um, and I think something, you know, as Mr. Olbert alluded to with, with Polgus is that's going to be a natural area. It gets heavy grass after the winter rains. People are never going to find the dog feces. It's going to become the same poop problem that exists as at, at Polgus. And, um, I just don't think it's, it's the best of ideas. Thanks. Thanks for your comments. Uh, Karen Bernstein. Hi, I live on uh, 136 Northam Avenue. I was one of the people who organized our community, whatever it was, four years ago, not to have a fenced-in dog park at Arguello because we thought it was inappropriate. Um, I walk my dogs on leash just about every day in Arguello Canyon. And I can tell you that most people walk their dogs off leash. Most of these same people claim that their dogs are under their control and they are absolutely not. They say, you know, come Rover, come, come, come Rover and Rover never comes. Um, I do extensive obedience training with my dogs. They sit on my command, but I still put them on leash because there's lots of distractions, lots of wildlife, lots of other dogs. Arguello, this, the, the dirt park as we call it in our neighborhood, is completely open, a curve in the road. It's, it's just a totally inappropriate place for off-leash dogs under any circumstances. And the city concluded after the residents complained that it was also not a, an appropriate place for a fenced-in dog park. So now, now proposing that it be an off-leash place is, is just totally, totally inappropriate. It's unsafe for the dogs. It's unsafe for the people uh, in the neighborhood. Thanks. Thanks for your comments. Uh, Gillian Newsom. All right. No, I'm sorry, Gillian. Sorry. Did I get the last name right? No. Oh, absolutely. So Gillian Newsom, 20-year resident. I'm one of the people still mourning the loss of the original City Hall Park. Uh, I understood that the reason that the park was closed on Sundays was because we were giving a break to the people who lived around and heard the constant dog barking, and those people 
were really represented well the last time I came for this, and now they're not here, and it just feels like, well, they're not here. We'll just open the park on Sundays. So that does not seem fair. So, And also, um, the dog park has really impacted life around the park. You walk by it, like that path that cuts through so conveniently, and it really smells like dog pee. I love dogs. I think they're wonderful. I've had them my whole life. I've always put them on a leash and walked them. It's great exercise. I watch how people interact with their dogs in the park. They don't look at them. They just let the dogs run. It's like, I don't know what the obsession is with letting your dog run off. They're dogs. They're great, but they're dogs, and I think they can just be walked. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Is there anyone else wishing to speak on this item? Okay. Gentlemen, what would you like to do? I'll, uh, <clears throat> I'll start. <clears throat> since it's such a difficult, I mean, I, I still, as I said earlier, I, I voted for the dog park in City Hall Park. It's fenced in. If you don't have a fenced in area, I mean, I, dogs, I don't have a dog, but that doesn't mean I haven't seen dogs. They run and they might be controllable, they might not be controllable, but they run and if they get a chance because they want to get out and exercise, who wouldn't? And if there's no fence, um, I'm concerned of with Vista, as I said before, that Vista is going to be, they're going to be off the leash right off the get-go from Crestview. And then again, as was mentioned about people that like to sit there or walk through the <coughs> finished part of Vista Park, I think the same thing could be said for Arguello. Um, so I'm not really uh, leaning toward either one of those. Um, for adding the hours, um, it, it you know, there's, there's, a, there's never going to be enough hours to, to walk your dog, I guess, or to let your dog off, uh, I would assume. And I'm not necessarily leaning to, to change the hours at all. Uh, it seems to work. Um, granted, there's always folks that would like more hours. But I could see what's going to happen here. And again, I'm not going to be here, but 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. And then they're going to extend it to 5. And then Sunday, it's going to be seven days a week. And I do have some empathy for the folks who live there. I, I really do. Um, I think it's still a great sh spot where we put the park, but I, I think uh, the hours, uh, to me at least, seem to be um, uh, reasonable. But that's, I certainly would like to hear my colleagues' comments on all of this. So, Mr. Collins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, when we f started this process, as I recall, it was because uh, there were a lot of complaints at Burton, it was closed down to, for the off-leash hours and then the discussion started around where we're we gonna put a dog park. And we had several alternatives, three that I can think of were Vista Park, Arguello and uh, uh, City Hall Park. I heard from residents in all three areas that um, you know, Arguello was not appropriate, Vista was not appropriate. In fact, I heard that even City Hall uh, area park was not appropriate. Um, but just to uh, sort of bring this back to how this new discussion started, I got a call in May, I guess, and a gentleman left me a message and I called him back and he said that he wanted more off-leash hours, but he wanted them at Burton Park. And I said, well, you know, uh, I'm not necessarily in favor of that, but you're welcome to come to a council meeting and speak in public comment because it's not on our agenda and tell us how you feel. So he came and he spoke and somehow that his wish to have these off-leash hours returned to Burton to Park got turned into a discussion of, of reviewing the City Hall dog park hours and then adding new uh, venues. Um, so when I, when I do a little bit of math, I always like to do math on everything. Um, there's, this park is open 300 days a year. I mean, if you take out Sundays and you take out holidays, give or take 300 plus days a year. Um, that's a lot of days. Uh, I got um, a lot of emails, particularly from some people in this room, about the impact of the dog park uh, on their lives across the street. Um, and I have to commend Amy. She worked tirelessly for months and months and months addressing those issues with the neighbors, with the dog owners. And it finally got resolved and I stopped getting emails from a lot of people. And to me, the situation has been fine. And 
I, I don't want the misinterpretation of some one person's comment to cause us to go back and change everything. I think that if we start adding hours at Garguela or Vista, the people up there are going to think of that as a betrayal. We, we've kind of been there, you know, and done that. Uh, and I know that there are issues with, uh, you know, dog waste and that sort of thing at this park. That's something that I guess we just have to um, continue uh, uh, to work on. But I think, in, you know, in this town, we've got a lot of places for people to, to take their dogs. And personally, I'm not in favor of making any changes at all. I just assume just leave it the way it is. Okay, thank you for your comment. Uh, Mr. Albert. Thank you, Bob. Um, I have to admit, I was actually surprised when, when the council uh, directed Parks and Rec to, to look into this because I would never have anticipated that, that uh, given what we went through setting up the City Hall dog park, that the request would have been made. Um, I'm fine with, with that. I think it's good actually occasionally to review um, the rules of the road, so to speak, because uh, the world constantly evolves and uh, it's good to check in on stuff. Um, however, I do think that, that the process may have forgotten one of the really important lessons of having hours at Burton Park and then finding out that that didn't work, which is basically a separation of uses issue. Okay, that it, 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 it doesn't really, dogs and athletics, dogs and people sit, wanting to sit around and enjoy the environment, at least off-leash dog areas, they're not really compatible uses. You have to separate them. And um, uh, as my other colleagues have just finished saying, I'm actually not in favor of making any changes at all to what we have today. However, I don't necessarily have a problem if staff and Parks and Rec Commission want to go back and spend a little bit more time thinking about a different kind of proposal, but one which recognizes that really important lesson, which is separation of uses. And probably separation of uses requires there be fencing, okay? Um, in, in, I suppose, you know, we could have probably left the fencing off around, oddly enough, the City Hall dog park, because there's no other use really that was, once we dedicated it to off-leash stuff, we did it mostly to protect the dogs from running into the streets. Um, but anywhere that you have multiple uses going on, have to keep them separate. Um, so uh, I, I'm not in favor of making any changes, but I'm happy to have staff and Parks and Rec go back and look at it, keeping that lesson in mind. Mr. Grocott? Yeah, I was just gonna say that I think the reason you didn't get any response from council is because nobody wanted to make a motion and look like they were supporting this. Uh, I think that's kind of where we are. I would ask, however, that staff uh, meet with this gentleman here who spoke and has, I think, for three years, things that have been of concern. And let's get those addressed. I think he's right. I've seen the same kind of thing where um, people pull up into the 20-minute parking, dogs jump out. Sometimes two or three dogs will jump out of a SUV completely out of control. and. Uh, and it can be a problem. So I think this gentleman has some uh, legitimate concerns and I would like if uh, staff would, would address those and get, get together with him. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Mr. Johnson. I'll just add my voice to that and <coughs> appreciate the comment and I know it's hard to police, but I think um, it, it's worth doing. Um, I did wanna just, I, I, I don't disagree. I mean, the, for me, the general principle is if you're gonna have off-leash dog park, that's adjacent to other uses, then there should be fencing. Um, I would say I don't think that a city council meeting is the best place to set the hours for the park. It, I, I do recall the conversation, the debate that we had last time, and it, you know, it was late at night, and you know, there's people talking on all sides, and um, we're trying to cut a compromise and make a decision about what's the best thing for a park. It's not a good environment to do that. I think that Amy and her team should have the authority to work with the dog owners, work with the neighbors, experiment with different hours. If it doesn't work, shift it around. Um, it shouldn't, you know, it shouldn't be a thing that, and particularly if something isn't working, that it's like, oh, well, we gotta wait six months and get it on a city council agenda and go through that whole thing again. It seems unnecessary, so. I don't know if anyone else wants to put in their voice on that as well, but I, I would prefer to just delegate this to the staff in terms of the hours at City Hall Park. I think, um all of us seem to have the same opinion. I, th I think Mr. Robert said it, and I guess Mr. Collins did too. You, you have to have separate, I think you still have to have separation somehow. 
I don't know how you do it, but you have to have separation. You just can't have a, uh, adjacent uses. And I think that, and again, I don't, I, I want to, uh, you know, thank Amy and, and, uh, and her staff and, and all the folks that came to the meetings and the Park and Rec Commission. I mean, they, again, trying to, you know, split the baby and, and do the best they could for everybody. But I think that at least the tenor of these five people up here is that it just isn't gonna, let's, let's leave it where it is and go back into, as Mark said, go back and look at it again. Um, but you have to have, I think, a separation. And, and again, I agree with Mr. Johnson also is that I don't know that we need to be discussing hours of, of and again, I wouldn't have any, if you wanna experiment out, and maybe next week you're going to do this, okay? But I'd, I'd keep it all in, you know, ex, sort of a, a pilot type thing and see how it works and monitor how it, it does work. Uh, and if there's some way, I know that's going to be expensive, but it'd be some way to get some sort of usage uh, numbers too of what out the hours. Maybe there's no maybe between four and seven o'clock at night, and I'm not saying it is. Uh, nobody uses it, you know, or something. I don't know that. I'm sure it's used pretty much most of the day. Although when it gets dark in the winter, I doubt it's used very much, but that's another whole story. So anyway, all right, we're good. Anything, Mr. Collins, you wanna make one more comment? Uh, one final comment. Okay. I, I agree with what you're saying, but if we're gonna do that, I would like to uh, see that we communicate that to the public that whatever changes we're making, this is a pilot program, it's a trial program, it's gonna be for a defined period of time, a week, two weeks, a month, or whatever. I don't want people thinking that, oh, now we've gone and changed the rules again and you have to have another council meeting or you have to have a parks and rec commission meeting to change it back. So, yeah. you know, if we're gonna do that, I'd like to see that happen. Okay, all right, moving on. Uh, we're gonna move 8C to uh, uh, move it up. So we'll jump to 8C. Consideration of adopting resolution awarding a one-time discretionary bonus to eligible employees in the amount of 5% of gross regular earnings for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2018 and appropriating funds from the general fund, unassigned fund balance. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of city council, Jeff Maltby, city manager, I'll be presenting this item uh, at your last council meeting as part of a uh, report to the council on uh, last fiscal year's uh, budget surplus of approximately $7 million, council asked if uh, staff could prepare an item for their consideration uh, of a bonus for uh, city staff members. Uh, we had some discussion um, about uh, putting some uh, parameters around this at the staff level. Um, based on council comments, it seemed like uh, something in the neighborhood of 5% uh, is reasonable. Uh, which I agree with um, looking at other bonus programs in the previous bonus program that this city had. We also felt that um, it would be most appropriate should the council want to grant a bonus that that bonus be applied to uh, gross reg regular wages so that would filter out over time or if somebody received a, a, a vacation overage uh, payout last year, any of those things, those would be excluded from the calculation. I uh, believe that um, the bonus should only be uh, awarded to current active employees in good standing. So if somebody worked for us last year but they've since retired or gone to work someplace else, um, they wouldn't receive a check in the mail from us uh, saying thanks for last year and we miss you and that. So they, that would not apply. Uh, in that, that means that uh, council members going off wouldn't get a check? I'm getting to council members, oh, okay. Mr. Mayor. Um, I know that. I'm just, uh, I'm just I, throwing it out there. I, I know you do. Um, uh, we believe that you have to be uh, have a, a satisfactory or better uh, performance evaluation, uh, and that uh, part-time uh, employees could receive the bonus if they were PERS eligible last year, so more than uh, 20 hours, and that would really filter out mostly the seasonal part-time uh, employees. Uh, who work in our recreation uh, programs. Uh, in addition, uh, the bonus we don't believe should be applied to the city manager, the city attorney, uh, or the city council. Uh, that's part of our recommendation. In running the calculations, uh, we believe that the uh, cost of a 5% bonus uh, under these uh, conditions would affect approximately 70 employees of the city and would cost between $350,000 and $400,000. That would be uh, a one-time uh, calculation. Uh, 
Uh, over the last uh, few weeks, I've gotten a number of questions from council members and members of the public about this particular issue. And so I thought I'd just provide sort of a, a summary of some um, of the most relevant points in answering those questions. Uh, the city's had eight straight years of budget surpluses, which amount to well over uh, $20 million. Uh, fiscal year 17 and 18, which ended uh, in last July, uh, was in fact the best financial year the city has experienced with a $7 million budget surplus. Uh, based on uh, council direction at the last meeting, $4.5 million of that surplus was put into the capital uh, projects. Uh, fund uh, 1.25 million uh, added to the unfunded liabilities fund, which I believe is a, has a balance currently of about $2 million. And the remainder was uh, put into the unallocated fund balance, which is kind of like a city's checking account balance, which has a current balance of $2.8 million. Of the $7 million surplus, one and a half million dollars came from salary and benefit savings uh, due to vacancies. Uh, attracting and retaining uh, city staff has gotten to be very difficult as unemployment rates remain uh, very low in the region while housing costs uh, uh, are cited by employees that are, are leaving us to take jobs elsewhere as the main reason that they'd like to be closer to home, reduce their commute time. Uh, and, and work in typically a similar profession uh, in another city. Despite being uh, shorthanded throughout the year, uh, city staff last year achieved uh, all their service and program goals and then some. Uh, we continue to break records in uh, all our departments in terms of activity, um, you know, permits that are being processed, programs that are being provided. Uh, as uh, mentioned before, I think this is uh, in many ways related to the local economy and just sort of the very robust nature of San Carlos right now in terms of the activity level of our community. Uh, over the last uh, several years, the council has placed more than $25 million in various reserves. That's approximately 60% of the city's operating budget. Uh, the city has set aside $2 million for a future com community foundation endowment and has donated more than $200,000 over the last several years to various community organizations and programs. Uh, the City Council just recently made a $6 million prepayment on its pension liabilities and can make its annual required contributions within long-range revenue and expenditure forecasts. Uh, the City set aside in irrevocable trusts $6 million for unfunded liability relating to our long-closed retiree medical uh, benefit program. Uh, between 2008 and 2010, city employees agreed to more than $1.5 million in salary and benefit reju reductions, uh, which included the uh, previous pay for performance program. Uh, I, I limited those savings to just the years of 2008 to 2010 because those were the years that were covered by those salary and benefit resos and MOUs. But you could argue that those savings have continued on uh, uh, to today, but just for the, for the sake of trying to define something from the past, those are the uh, parameters that I used to come up with that number. Uh, any bonus would be considered one time only. Um, our legal assessment and talk, talking with our uh, legal, our personnel legal counsel is that these bonuses would not be persable. Uh, ultimately, of course, that is uh, the judge, the PERS would, will have to render judgment on that. Um, regardless of the outcome, for 45% of our staff, they would definitely not be persable. Uh, because 45% of our staff uh, are not considered classic members of PERS, they're PEPRA, they're newer employees, and the law was very specific that any bonuses for those employees are not PERSable. So we know the answer to 45% is it's not PERSable. We believe the answer um, to the rest is it also would not be PERSable. Uh, however, in our estimates of 350,000 to 400,000, we've included the PERS cost for 55% of our employees uh, to err on the site of caution for you tonight. Uh, 
that dollar amount with, within those larger dollars for PERS would be about $25,000. So when I say 350, it, it could potentially be as low as 325. Uh, if it's 400, it, uh, it could be potentially as low as 375, but 400 would be the ceiling uh, based on that. Uh, a bonus of, of 5% based on the criteria that I've discussed and outlined for you earlier um, would represent about 5 to 6% of the $7 million surplus. So. Um, 94 to 95 percent would go uh, for various projects and community uh, services with the five to six percent number uh, being paid in a bonus to staff. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, the council might have uh, as you take a look and discuss this particular item. Thank you, Mr. Malpe. Mr. Albert. Know what Jeff answered the question I was going to ask. All right. Should have called, should have called my wife. That's all right, Mr. Collins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to clear something up. You, um, you said 45% of the employees uh, would not be persable. Guaranteed, not persable. 45% of them. We believe it's 100%, uh -huh. but 45% of our employees are are what's referred to as PEPRA employees, which means. They joined the city um, after the statewide election, which curtailed uh, public pensions, so they have a lesser pension program. And one of the criteria that was in that law when it was adopted is that any bonuses granted to PEPRA employees are very specifically not persable. So the number you mentioned, uh, 350 to 400K, I just want to clarify the fact that you you included potential all potential PERS costs in that. We wouldn't get a surprise of from PERS that they'd say, oh well, you need to oh, you need to pay another fifty thousand or something. That's correct. If if the if we have to pay PERS on fifty five percent of the employees, that amount would be twenty five thousand dollars, and we've calculated that into these numbers for you tonight, so that there aren't any surprises in the okay. future. So this is kind of worst case. This is the maximum case, yes. Um, how much, coming down to dollars and cents, what, what does it mean to any particular, or the average employee, and I know it's, we've got a discrepancy in salaries, but if you average it out, how much are we talking about per employee? And I assume it's all taxable, right? You're yeah, going to take yeah, taxes out of it, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it's all taxable. The average, if you were to run the number on this amount for 70 employees, I believe it's about $5,000. About $5,000, okay. Any other questions? Mr. Collins, are you done? Yes. Okay. Uh, we have some speaker cards. Uh, first, John Hoffman. John? Welcome back. Thank you. Uh, I realize that any type of surplus of tax money uh, burns a hole in the public pocket, but I believe it would not be responsible to make a bonus. There are so many other things for which the money is needed. Primarily, or first of all, uh, we are tens of millions of dollars underfunded for pensions. And surely that's one of the things it should go for if it's going to go for anything. If it doesn't go for that, we've got streets that need mending. Uh, I can give you a long list of potholes uh, in streets that uh, need attention. Um, bonuses are supposed to be for exceptional, not simply for average. Therefore, logically, they do not go to everybody, but to those merit-based people who, or merit-based performance, who um, have done exceptional work above and well beyond. I simply think that providing a bonus simply because we have a surplus does not make sense. Thank you, John. Uh, Carol Vonk? Carol? Welcome 
Welcome back. Thank you, council members. Um, I don't really want to weigh in on the Christmas bonus. I'm sure the employees deserve it. However, I would like to make a comment on the remaining, which is probably more than six and a half million in surplus. And there are three suggestions I'd like to make for your consideration. The first is I would like to see the city develop design guidelines for our commercial areas. That would be Laurel Street and the El Camino Real. It's really imperative that we maintain our village atmosphere and based on a lot of the new um, renovations that have been going on uh, that have developed large flat swaths of glass. It started with the um, pizza place, I never know how to pronounce it, Paxi. And now we have three more on the right hand or west side of Laurel Street, uh, the two kind of hamburger places. Um, and now the new Dwell real estate office, oh my God. Um, in any event, if we want to maintain our village atmosphere, we really need to develop some design guidelines for the Planning Commission to follow. And the Secretary of the Interior uh, has set standards for village type um, downtowns, and that usually consists of recessed doorways and, um, you know, mass broken up and all of that. I won't go into the details, but that's what the design guidelines would look at. Second, I would like to see the city take control of the Carlos Club sign and restore it. This is a beacon to the public that they have arrived in San Carlos and that big black hole there. I mean, even I miss the left turn lane frequently coming off of El Camino Real. I'm sure the city can do this easily with an easement. They can buy an easement of that sign and take control of it. Third and last, we have a historic resource survey in San Carlos that I worked on personally, as did many other people in the community. It is now 17 years old. And it is recommended that these be updated every five years by the Office of Historic Preservation at the state level. Uh, when we did it way back, I think it was uh, finally approved in 91, somewhere around that time. We were limited to 50 properties, um, and that was under a grant that we got through San Mateo County Historical Association. Anyway, it needs to be updated, um, and that would be consistent with the city's general plan. We do have a historic preservation element. We don't even have an ordinance, historic preservation ordinance, which is kind of surprising. Anyway, those are my three suggestions that we could spend probably a drop in the bucket uh, out of this seven million excess that we have. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Andrew Taylor. Andrew, welcome back. Thank you. Um, I guess first, firstly, I kind of question the timing on this. Would ask council to maybe look at putting this off to another session because this coming after the, not many people were aware of it. There were a lot of people away for the Thanksgiving weekend. Um, and I think it debates a wider public discussion. Um, but that said, uh, you know, when you guys a couple weeks ago discussed the um, city council salaries, which was long overdue for an adjustment, part of the argument there was to look at what's going on <clears throat> what's going on with other cities in the area and compare ourselves to our neighbors. Have you looked at, if you look at this, there's not a municipality in the Bay Area that's doing bonuses for city employees. Um, everybody knows the next recession is coming and is right around the corner. As I think I wrote to several of you, two thirds of Wall Street's economists today are projecting a recession in 2020. What are you gonna do then? You might be, Every city, every public agency has been in the fortunate place of having increasing revenues in the last three to four years after the Great Recessions. It's money that's just falling out of the sky. We see it at mid-pen. Um, I've been in public finance for 25 plus years. And even though the city's done a lot to arrange its finances in the last few years, you look at your unfunded liability, you've got $42 million 
in unfunded liabilities in the pension plans. The primary one for CalPERS for the miscellaneous plan has gone from 15 to 21.4 million just in the last three years. CalPERS, all of these numbers that are today predicated upon the fact that CalPERS is gonna return 7% a year every year, year in, year out. If they don't hit that mark, then pension contributions from the city are gonna go up, the unfunded liability is gonna go up. And I think right now, it's just not the place or the time to do it. Most agencies are, when I talk to my boss, it's like, what keeps us up at night? It's CalPERS. And how are we gonna finance it? And we're actually one of the better funded agencies. We have a 30% of our annual revenues are set aside in an unassigned balance. And here you've got a $35 million city and you've got $2 million. It's absolutely nothing. You guys, I'm sorry, you can pat yourselves on the backs all day long, but the financial situation of the city today is not as strong as you think. And with the next recession coming, it's gonna put you in a bad spot. Thanks. Thanks for your comments. Is there anyone else wishing to speak on this matter? Yes, ma'am. Just fill out a card later for me, would you? I did. You did. Okay. Okay. <laughs> These are really nice shoes. I love these shoes. Um, I could not agree with the previous gentleman more. I spend a lot of my time worrying about unfunded, unfunded liabilities everywhere. Um, so if that's really the size of our unfunded liabilities, we should be in panic mode, not in um, giving out bonus mode. So I had written a letter to, to the city council members earlier about this issue, looking at fire and, and cleaning up our canyons, which have not been cleaned up in um, forever. And as I said, I walk in our Guelo Canyon every day. It's full of brush, it's full of broom, it's full of dead trees. We do not want to end up like paradise, um, which is not paradise. So, um, you know, to me, the money should go for, for things like canyon cleanup, potholes, pensions, um, it should not go for bonuses, and while I'm at it, it shouldn't go for spending half a million dollars to buy some parking spaces. So. Okay, thank you for your comments. Okay, uh, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I just had a follow-up question for Jeff. So, you know, our, our staff essentially reports to Jeff, who is our essentially our chief executive officer has a strong um, role in kind of recommending compensation for our employees. You know, I, I don't know all of the history of, of past bonus plans and incentive compensation, but I, I think my, my general question to you is, if you were to look out and you had more flexibility, would you prefer to have a bonus system, which we don't have today? I mean, do you think that would be a thing that would be good for our staff, good for recruiting and retaining talent, good for sort of the effectiveness of the city staff to be able to execute its mission. What are your thoughts? Um, I think it uh, depends on the program. Uh, I think they can be a powerful tool, particularly um, now while you're trying to retain people uh, to give you a little added incentive to keep them here as opposed to moving. Typically, uh, in this area, you see them mostly with, uh, executive compensation. Uh, Pacific has a program that's for all employees. Uh, Redwood City has an employee that's for all executive management employees. Um, South San Francisco has a variation that's kind of a modified program, but it's for all employees. Menlo Park is looking at a program right now. My advice would be not to put it into MOUs um, so that you're obligated. One of the difficulties that we had, I know when the city had a program previously, is that it, it caused um, some performance evaluations to get very contentious because there was potential money linked to which box gets checked. Uh, this type of approach that the council is considering is more on the macro as opposed to uh, individual uh, outstanding performance as Mr. Hoffman pointed out and I think quite correctly that is certainly uh, one measure of a program like this. 
But I think looking at the performance of the city on the macro in a city that's as small as this, you know, with just a little bit over 70 employees in, in the whole city um, might be a more effective and motivational tool for a bonus program for the council to consider when you look at um, the year we've had, how our finances are, all the different uh, metrics and levers that the council is constantly touching base with uh, in terms of setting those priorities, setting those goals, doing the strategic planning, surveying the community, all those types of things. I think you have a very good handle on when the city's busy. Um, you know, uh, Council Member Grocott, Council Member Grisilli have, uh, have a longer view, having had a longer tenure on the council of uh, when performance was down, and not necessarily because of individual performance being off or bad in any way, but because the economy was slow and building permits weren't coming in the door and programs weren't being expanded and the council was, uh, very much curtailing their own desire to to expand services because of those dollars and cents. So I think the five of you are very well positioned to take a look at a bonus program like this and judge the overall performance of the city uh, for the last year. Um, you know, no city employee in the city uh, prior to this would have received a bonus since I think 2007, so it's been 11 years since bonuses were granted uh, by the city. The nice thing about bonuses is that they're one time and they don't lead to the long-term uh, potential downside of creating millions of dollars of liability. It, it's a fixed dollar amount, you know exactly what it is, you spend the money one time and uh, that's it, any future expenditure would be considered by the council. And I quite frankly think it's very important for the council to be the body that's involved in considering this. For myself as your city manager, I can say I'm extremely proud of the staff that we have. Um, they work very hard, they're very responsive to the community and their needs. Uh, they're a very positive uh, group who is really focused on uh, not assigning blame or creating turf wars within the community or the organization, but simply trying to solve problems and work with our community. Uh, so that's my take. I had a quick question, and, and Mr. Uh, City Attorney stopped me if I go off line here. It's, it's been mentioned, and I don't want to get the exact numbers, but uh, you know, it's been implied that, that certainly we have a, a, an, an unfunded liabilities of substantial dollars, and I know we do, every city has it, every organization has it, as was mentioned. Um, but I also know that, uh, as far as I understood, we have a, a plan. We know it's gonna, our, our purse costs are probably gonna go up 30 to 50%, I think, in the next few years, and correct me if I'm wrong on that. Uh, what, if you could give the, the short version, if that's allowable, Mr. City Attorney, Mr. Uh, uh, City Manager, give the, the short version of what our, what our long range plan is, because it's not like we're not paying attention. I know all of us up here are very, well aware of it. So is that, is that appropriate, Mr. City Attorney, I ask that question? Oh, yeah, sure, that's okay, appropriate. Just, yeah. That's fine, just wanna make sure. I wanna blow anything the last week, so. So um, the council for a number of years has been setting money aside uh, into a reserve, the balance of which currently is $2 million. Uh, it was much higher a few months ago before you made a, a $6 million prepayment right. uh, to PERS, uh, which actually had the effect of lowering uh, our annual contribution to PERS by $600,000 a year. However, the council left that money, that $600,000 in the budget. So you're gonna be saving that and I imagine rolling that or considering anyway, rolling that forward into your, uh, any future uh, reserve or pre-funding that you may wanna consider for unfunded liabilities. Um, there are a number of cities uh, around us in this very county that are struggling with their uh, uh, current and projected uh, PERS payments. We're not one of them. Uh, we've been looking at this issue uh, pretty significantly for uh, well over a decade. Uh, we were one of the first, if not the first cities to begin tiering our pension benefits and setting up reserves for uh, unfunded liabilities. And I think it's important to remember that when the unfunded liabilities are calculated and you look at that number, which will range between 30 and $50 million, depending on how 
how you want to parse it, that number isn't a number that's owed today. It's not unfunded today. It's the amount by which you're going to pay over the next 30 years. It's not unlike a mortgage in, in that regard. I don't have the money today to pay off my mortgage that will be paid off in 20 years or 15 years or whatever it is, but I have the wherewithal to make the payments to pay my mortgage off and the city right now and all our current projections and long range projections um, has the money to do that and, and the council's been proactive and and finding ways to ensure that that number for us isn't actually going up in real dollars, it's been now this year going down. Uh, and that's something that um, didn't happen overnight. It took a lot of planning on the council and staff's part over many years to find ourselves uh, in this position. And we're quite lucky to be in the position that we're in. And I don't think we should take it for granted in any way, shape or form. And we should continue to uh, be vigilant in our finances and how we look at this. We talk with the council once, if not twice, specifically about unfunded liabilities um, every year. And we will, I'm sure, want to continue to do that moving forward so that it remains on the radar and the council has the appropriate information to make what they feel like are appropriate financial decisions on behalf of the community moving forward. Okay, thank you. All right, gentlemen, what do you want to do on this item? Well, I would assume you'd probably want a motion. Well, you can have a motion and then we can have discussion after the motion, yes. All right, let me do a motion and then we can, we can talk. Um, Mr. Mayor, I'll move to adopt resolution 2018-111. 111. Um, <clears throat> resolution of the City Council and the City of San Carlos awarding a one-time discretionary bonus to eligible employees in the amount of 5% of gross regular earnings for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2018 and appropriating funds from the general fund unassigned fund balance. Is there a second? I'll make a motion, I'll make it a second so we can discuss it. We'll see where we're going here. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a competing motion. Sure. Um, I move to adopt resolution 2018-111, a resolution of the City Council of the City of San Carlos awarding a one-time discretionary bonus to eligible employees in the amount of 5% of gross regular earnings for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2018, and appropriating funds from the general fund unassigned balance and to uh, appropriate funds from the general fund unassigned balance or such other funds as may be needed in order to provide a aggregate $1 million reduction in uh, community paid uh, either sewer taxes or sewer fees or um, garbage fees. Okay, there's the motion. Is there a second on that one? Uh, Mr. Mayor, before offering a second, can I just ask Mr. Olbert a question? Sure. So. Uh, Mark, you're suggesting that we do this plus take an additional amount of money and and in a form of a rebate on sewer taxes and that sort of thing. Correct. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mayor, um, before um, this motion moves forward, um, I have a concern that the the competing motion, the, the additional part is not something that's been on our agenda. Um, and it it may be something that could be placed on a future agenda, but tonight there hasn't, the staff report doesn't talk about that. The, the agenda item doesn't talk about um, allocating monies other than for the bonus. So I do have a concern about that. All right. Uh, anyway, the motion is made. Is there a se through, through the chair? Yes. Uh, Mr. Rubens, since I discussed with you making this motion, I think it was last week, it would have been really helpful if you had mentioned that concern when we spoke. Uh, anyway, the motion, uh, the competing motion was made. Is there a second to that competing motion? All right, hearing none, uh, no, no second, that motion dies. So the first motion is now on the table. Mr. Collins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as a matter of rule, uh, some people might be surprised to hear me to say this, but I'm not really in favor of bonuses. I wasn't, I don't think I ever have been. And we've never really been in the position to do that until this year. Um, but this was unexpected, it was unprecedented. Um, Mr. City Manager, correct me if I'm wrong, but we've never had this before. And has any city in the state of California ever had a one-time $7 million bonus that you're aware of? Any city of our size? Surplus, <laughs> you mean? Oh, well, I, um, it would, 
it would certainly be rare. Right? I can definitely say that for okay. a city our size. Um, whether or not it's happened before or not, yeah. I would have to believe in the last hundred years. It's okay. It's happened somewhere. It's probably happened somewhere, but not in a town like ours. Um, and I also wouldn't be in favor of it if uh, we were trying to just take money out of general reserves or some budget category or something like that. But let's talk a, a minute about, you know, what we are going to do with six and a half million dollars. Six and a half million dollars that we didn't know we were going to get. Uh, we had we had no warning of this. Uh, we had a feeling, but not really a warning until a few months ago. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to add a million and a quarter to our unfunded liabilities reserve. Um, uh, this council, as was previously mentioned, has already authorized over $6 million to reduce our unfunded pension liabilities this year. And as also has been previously uh, mentioned, that's $600,000 a year going forward. So that 600000 basically is one and a half times or more what we're proposing tonight to do on a one-time basis. Second thing we're doing is adding nearly $5 million to infrastructure projects research. I got a lot of emails, well, why aren't we fixing the roads? Why aren't we fix fixing the streets? Why aren't we fixing potholes? I, I completely agree with everything that people said in the emails. In fact, and some I wrote back and I said, I agree, we should do all those things. But the point is, we are doing them, and we have the money to do them, um, we now have more money to do them. So, you know, streets, sidewalks, parks, maintenance, um, even adding to public safety, all of those things are things that benefit our residents. And the last thing is previously mentioned, we're adding a million dollars to our contingency fund, which we use every year for unforeseen expenditures uh, in good times and bad. That's just prudent for us to do it because stuff comes up and we need to have the money to do it. Um, the other thing we haven't talked about is uh, what some people refer to as a rainy day fund. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, today it has a balance of over, of over $6 million. Uh, I don't know how many cities of our size, and I should probably qualify everything I say with cities of our size and our population. I don't know how many cities our size are as in good a shape we are and have a $6 million um, balance in their, un, in their unallocated uh, reserve fund that is specifically set for economic downturns. I think that is responsible fiscal management, and I think it's a credit to everybody who works uh, in San Carlos you know, that we're in this position today. Remember, 94% is what we're proposing to be allocated to all these things, so we're really talking about 5% or less. So. Uh, and I may be the only person here, but I don't think there's any with anything wrong with providing a belated bonus to employees who took salary and benefit reductions 10 years ago. Many of them can't even afford to live in San, Mate in San Carlos. Uh, some can't even afford to live in San Mateo County. We do live in the most expensive county in, probably in the country, or one of the most expensive co counties. Um, and think about this, if you took that, let's just call it 400,000 because that's the high end. Take that 400,000 and amortize it over 10 years. Well, that's what, $40,000 a year, and when you divide by 70 employees, that's about $50 a month. Now, if we had said 10 years ago, we're gonna give everybody a $50 a month raise, would anybody have raised an eyebrow? Maybe because, you know, we didn't have, uh, you know, we were in a bad, uh, uh, economic downturn, but that's how I look at it. So I just, you know, the point I want to make is that I, I, while I understand all the comments, everybody has valid comments, and if we don't do it, we're really in no worse shape, but I believe that the people who work for this city make the city what it is. Um, and I was, a rep, I was elected to, repre to represent everybody who lives in San Carlos, but I think it's the right thing to do that we show our belated appreciation for the hard work and dedication for the people who work for this city as well as the people who live in this city. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Crocott. Thank you. Um, on this topic, we, I'm sure all of you got the same emails that I did, and I didn't get one email that said, way to go, good job, give a bonus. Every one of them talked about being cautionary, uh, some people mentioned the things that Andrew mentioned about uh, forecasting a recession. Uh, a lot of people mentioned unfunded liabilities. One of the things I haven't heard mentioned 
is we have unfunded liabilities with the, the you know, citywide, but we also have a fire department that we used to have that we're dealing with every uh, six months. We get a report on what those unfunded pension liabilities are. Um, I just feel like it, it, with respect to the list that, that Mr. Collins gave about the things that we have we will be putting money towards, we could simply put more towards those things. Um, I said earlier in the year that one of the things we're suffering from, predominantly because of all the construction going on, is a lot of damage to our infrastructure, our sidewalks, our, our roads uh, in the downtown area. There's been a lot of damage and it needs repairing. Um, we should probably wait until all that construction is finished before we go around and repair it, but it, it does need attention. So I just think there's a lot of things that this money could be spent on, include including uh, a rainy day fund. I agree that two million is not that much given uh, the size of our budget and our operating cost, and, and it, you know part of that is because we, as, as was noted, we took a big chunk of that that was there and paid it towards unfunded liabilities. Um, and lastly, I just feel like, I, I feel really, I would feel really uncomfortable voting yes on this because if there was ever an opportunity to have a quote unquote town hall meeting, this would be it to say to the whole city, look, we've, we've got this, we wanna have a special meeting. We want to get ideas like Ms. Vonk pr proposed. She, she had three things. I'm sure if you asked anybody on the uh, in San Carlos, they'd all come up with something. Um, and so I, th I think that would be the healthy thing to do is to to hold an actual town hall meeting on this and say, hey, you know, we've we've got this extra money we weren't expecting. What do you, as the taxpayers, as the residents, what, what are your priorities? Um, not that council, you know, doesn't make the ultimate decision, but in order to hear from the public, um, I, I think that would be a good thing. And the last thing I wanted to say that, uh, about this is, I was reflecting on this and I was reflecting back to um, some time ago before we approved the Wheeler Plaza project. And I felt really badly that uh, there was a, an older couple, a Korean couple that owned a cleaners. And that was their retirement fund, was to sell their business to somebody else and, and then you know retire. And we took that away from them. And I knew we were taking it away from them. And I brought it up and I, I got it agendized. And, and essentially what we were told, what the city attorney told us is, you can't make a gift of public funds. Well, tell me, what are we doing here but making a gift of public funds? We have contracts with all our employees. They know what they're getting paid. They know, uh, you know what the deal is. And to come along and offer, on average, $5,000 to each and every one of them, that's a gift. If we were talking about you know, a $500 holiday bonus or something like that, I wouldn't blink an eye, but $5,000, that's a lot. So there's not any way I can vote for this. Okay, thank you for your comments. Mr. Albert. Thank you, Bob. Um, actually, before I go through the points I wanted to make, may I follow up on something that you pointed out? Because um, I have to admit, I didn't even think about the issue of uh, gifts of public funds, and I just wanted to ask Mr. Rubens whether or not that is an issue here. <laughs> I mean, because I know we pay people, so that's not a gift of public funds, but. Yeah, I think the way this is presented by um, the city manager for service that was provided in the past um, is certainly within the purview of your uh, providing additional compensation for that service as a reward. I mean, there's a public purpose is certainly the aspect of, all the aspects of employees, the same, the same um, decision-making process that a private sector employee, uh, employer might uh, employ in, in doing that, or a uh, or you figuring out, hey, uh, 
based on the facts that were presented by the city manager that um, the the prior pay cuts and other things um, and the performance of the city and the performance of the staff on a macro level um, is an appropriate um, use of the public funds. So it's not really a gift because you're providing um, compensation for service that was performed in the past. You're not doing it prospectively in other words. Thank you, Greg, I, I appreciate that. Although thank you, Matt, for bringing it up because it still feels a little bit like a gift to me. So, I th and again, I appreciate that. I didn't even think of it. Um, I, I had a few points that I wanted to make um, and uh, I, I don't support this measure as it's structured. I would have supported the one that, that uh, I was proposing, uh, which would have basically put the residents to the fore of sort of compensating or rewarding both staff and the residents for all the hard work that both have done because uh, staff has done a lot of hard work, uh, but the residents have put up an awful lot too. Uh, over the last few years with all the development that's been going on. But, you know, that's water under the bridge at this point, although I suppose we could come back and look at it later. Um, just a couple of points. In general, my experience with, with incentive compensation programs is um, certainly there are instances where uh, doing them ad hoc after the fact when nobody expected them uh, is, uh, does provide value from an organizational motivation retention point of view. Everything I was trained in and saw in my private sector career is generally those traits are better and amplified when it's a known program ahead of time, not sort of out of the blue, because the surprise factor actually dilutes the benefit from that point of view, because people didn't know that it was gonna be happening. Um, so that, that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm not terribly pleased about this, although I'd certainly be willing to consider creating some kind of, or resurrecting some kind of incentive compensation program just done in a more planned fashion. Um, another point that occurred to me is, uh, Jeff, you had talked about, what was it, 45% of the employees are PEPRA, which means they've joined since 2000... 13? 2013. Okay, 2013. Um, that means that that percentage of employees basically were, I mean, they were not subject to the salary reductions that, that we've talked about. They certainly came into an environment where the city was recovering from that. But I know ever since I've been on the council, uh, we've worked really hard. I've always been pretty insistent on making sure that we look at how we are compensating people relative to market. Uh, not only because that's the fair thing to do, but also because if you don't compensate people r relative to market, uh, you end up losing people very quickly. Um, and so, you know, it's almost like half of the employee pool that we're talking about. I'm not sure that the argument, that part of the argument that's being made actually even applies. Um, the, uh, um, I also think it's worth pointing out that it's certainly true that ultimately one hopes that every dollar that comes into the city that doesn't get paid out to, uh, as compensation in one form or another, uh, does do something to directly benefit uh, the community. But I'd ask everybody to keep in mind that, and I've been talking about this for years now, our reserves have grown dramatically over the last seven or eight years. So rapidly, in fact, that when I first started bringing this up, the council wasn't even aware how much money they had, okay? And part of that's because of the way we account for it. Um, and. We certainly have been doing plenty of things in all that time, but there's a lot of money building up that could be used to improve the quality of life that isn't yet being used to improve the quality of life. And my feeling is that if we're not going to actually sort of announce and pursue what projects we're going after with that, well then, if we're gonna give bonuses out to staff, maybe we should effectively give some kind of bonus out to the residents as well, because that, if nothing else, would benefit them. Um, so those are kind of the, the, the basic concerns that I have. I, I'm happy to uh, a longer run to talk about incentive compensation programs. They are a valuable tool in almost every organization I'm familiar with. But this one, the way it sort of came up and the way it's sort of handled and, and just not, in my opinion, having a fair balance with the direct immediate interest of residents, it's not something that I support. Okay, thank you for your comments. Mr. Johnson. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I guess I would start by saying I, I do appreciate the sentiment. I know, Ron, you, you suggested this, and it is a, it is a very nice thing to suggest, um, and I appreciate the spirit of it. I, I think we have outstanding staff. I think the city runs on people. We have great people. I, I've been an advocate for paying 
uh, market or sometimes ahead of market because I think um, the cost of living is going up a lot and we benefit and the whole community benefits when we can attract and retain great people. Um, and I think we should continue to do that. I, however, th I think that the this particular proposal is a, is a little half-baked. Um, and the reason it troubles me is because, you know, as been pointed out by other folks, there, there's essentially like two ways in which we typically organizations do bonuses. One is a specific individual has an outstanding job, you know, does an outstanding job, exceeds expectations, hits all their targets, et cetera, and you compensate them for outstanding um, performance. Or the organization as a whole exceeds its performance and then everybody shares in the, you know, in the excess revenue, et cetera. Um, and, I, and I think that's what's kind of being proposed here. The, the problem for me is that we are not a money-making operation. This is not a private business. And we shouldn't say, hey, staff, you had a great year because revenue exceeded expenses. We are a service organization and we judge ourselves based on how much impact we have in the community. So, I mean, I am, I'm totally open to incentive compensation, but if it's on an individual basis, I, I'm very pleased with we've moved more towards performance-based budgeting and tracking and having metrics. I think it's great if we say, hey, a particular employee or group of employees way exceeded their targets for the year, they deserve a bonus, we put that in comp, we, we budget it, and we have, a, we have a bonus pool and we pay it out. That would be great. Or if we said, hey, the entire organization's Christmas bonus is tied to something like our citizen survey results or something like that, where we say, hey, if the community is very happy with the overall performance of the city in a given year, then everybody gets a, a bonus. I think that would be fine as well. I just think that the, the message that we're sending, which is because the economy is up, because we've made some good choices in investment, then Therefore, we should compensate everyone. And then, hey, you know, the economy is in a recession. Everybody's trying extra hard, but hey, sorry, there's no, there's no bonus for you because, because it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. If, if you were coming back to us and saying, hey, the finance department has run this city exceptionally well, and that is shown in the fact that we have this huge surplus, that would make a lot more sense to me. So I think bonuses, and in changing incentive comp is great. I just think a one-time thing out of the blue tied to just a specific you know, moment in, in the economy, it just feels, it, it contributes to this overall sense of public distrust by a minority of folks about public employees. Public employees are great public servants. They're not the villains that we make them out to be, but, but I think we do a disservice to them if we don't you know, communicate who we're paying, why we're paying, and what what it is that they're accomplishing and impacting on behalf of the community. So, okay. Well, um, I disagree. But again, we all come from different places and where we worked, and how we did things in our lives. The company that I worked for had bonuses. Um, whether we had good years or bad years, the people worked very very hard, and management always tried to figure out ways to give them compensation. Uh, however, in bad years, management didn't get any compensation. Um, and that was the way we ran it. We made sure that people who worked hard got rewarded for it. I think this is a, a concept here that we're, that the city manager is, or this, this item rather is being proposed is not because it's there, but because uh, of all the hard work that was put in in this past year with some folks that didn't have, should we say, funded positions. Um, I, you know, I, to the comment of, of having a public meeting, and, and, and believe me, uh, it would be an interesting public meeting. You'd probably only have 77 places where folks would want to put the, the money, but it would still come back to city council. And we're the five people that got elected that are supposed to, you know, um, uh, should we say, manage uh, manage it. Um, I just it, just, it just seems to me that we've, we've, we've put money in all these different pots and this is another pot that, that I think shows the employees that we, we value them. If, 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 if the unemployment rate was 25% in, in this county, that's one thing, but it's 2% or a little above 2%. Everybody is struggling to find good people. Uh, every week we get a, a, a city council newsletter and there's always 
six, it seems six or seven jobs that we're interviewing for or that we're replacing or whatever. And I think this is a, a situation where I think part of the reason is to try to show folks, hey, if you stick with us, we'll stick with you. And I think this is what we're trying to do to make sure in the long run we have a, a group of people that, that are doing a fine job, and we have had a group of people doing a fine job, but it sort of shows that our city is willing to, to compensate folks if we have a situation where we feel that they've done even an extraordinary type job. So I'm gonna be supporting this motion, and I think we should uh, move forward with it, but there we go. So we have a motion on the floor. Is there any further discussion from the dais? Any other comments? All right, I guess we have to have roll call then. Councilmember Obert? No. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? No. Councilmember Johnson? No. And Mayor Grisilli? Yes. All right, the motion fails. All right, moving on to um, going back to 8B, uh, which is consideration of adopting a resolution authorizing the city manager to execute the purchase agreement to purchase a portion of real property located at 1201-1225 San Carlos Avenue, APN 0501322220 in the amount of $500,000 and execute necessary documents to effectuate a word that I've never used before, uh, the purchase and appropriating $500,000 from the Strategic Property Acquisition Reserve Fund for the purchase. Mr. Suve. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council. What I'd like to do is start by orienting you just a little bit uh, before I get into the details of this proposal. And so let's see, one moment. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so um, let's go back a bit. This, just to orient you again, this is San Carlos. The uh, location that we're talking about is uh, here at San Carlos Avenue. We have Laurel Street. It's in the downtown, in the heart of our downtown. Here's the Wheeler Plaza project along Walnut Street, as you can see here. And here's the Sister City Alley and the service area that runs behind the buildings, uh, like um, uh, Wells Fargo and, and other buildings in this location here. So this blue area represents an area that a number of years ago when the Wheeler Plaza project was being discussed, um, there was a discussion about, well, if Wheeler Plaza was to go forward, what would the community want? And one of the things that uh, the community said is they would like more gathering areas in the downtown like Laurel Park. It used to be called Laurel Park, right? Now it's uh, Frank Harrington Park, but uh, people wanted more gathering spaces in the downtown. Um, so a number of years ago, in conjunction with the Wheeler Plaza uh, development project and with the knowledge that during the construction process, the city would need parking, uh, the city acquired the old Foodville building, which was located right here along Laurel Street. And the city also owned a driveway that was used to access, a, for years and years, it was used to access from Laurel Street into the uh, Wheeler Plaza parking lot, as many will recall. The property that the city is interested in acquiring uh, this uh, piece from is located here at, at 1201 San Carlos Avenue at the corner of Laurel Street and San Carlos Avenue. So this is uh, the area, uh, blow up of the area, and here's San Carlos Avenue again and Laurel Street. And um, just as a point of reference, you have Blue Line Pizza, which is located on the corner. So this is that um, driveway that I spoke about, and there's a driveway curb cut located here at Laurel Street. Um, and again, that was for many years, and Foodville came up just right about to the edge of that, of that area. And, and as you know, it's used for parking. So um, if the city was to develop a plaza, which is the intent of the city, a public plaza, a park-like area located here, which is the intent of the city now, Eventually, this driveway would need to be closed off. Currently, this, uh, the owner of this property at 1201 San Carlos Avenue 
also owns this a small sidewalk at the at the rear of the building and also five parking spaces that are located here uh, along this um, driveway and the issue um, is um, if we were to build a plaza there um, it would create an unusual situation and and maybe even uh, an unsafe situation if the property owner tried to maintain some kind of a vehicular access area along here next to a public plaza. Uh, in addition, acquisition of this uh, piece would increase the size of the of the public plaza area fairly significantly. You're looking at almost 1,500 square feet, which is uh, a little more than the size of some of the smaller homes in some of our well-established neighborhoods in total square footage. So this is the area of acquisition. It's about 15 feet by 99 feet in area. And um, in terms of the agreement terms, the owner has agreed to allow the city to acquire this property under these terms, uh, purchase price of $500,000. They would like an easement at the rear of the building so that they can hand truck things in and out of doorways at the, at the rear uh, of the building there. They would like us to construct a trash enclosure for their tenants because we would be closing that area off at some point with the, the plaza and uh, to move the trash into a, a future commercial space that would be built uh, as part of this um, plaza development project. And the city had also envisioned some kind of a restaurant or retail space along the plaza to activate that space. Um, and so they would also like it, if it is a public plaza next to something like Blue Line, they would like the ability in the future to use it for uh, potentially some cafe seating out on the plaza. The city could consider that. They would like to get a credit for those five parking spaces that they would be losing uh, if they desired to develop the property uh, more in the future. Um, and they would like the uh, right to um, have first right of re refusal if the city doesn't build a plaza there at some point in the future, and um, that we cover all the closing costs and do the documents uh, for this, um, this acquisition. So these are the terms of the agreement. The, the um, property owner has signed the agreement, uh, and what we're asking for tonight is for the city council to authorize our city manager to sign the purchase agreement uh, to go ahead and, and move forward with this acquisition. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Seve. Mr. Albert. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Al. Nice presentation. Um, you touched on a couple of these, but I'd like you to, for the benefit of the public, perhaps expand on them a little bit. Um, uh, my, my sense is that if we don't do this transaction, we're, we're gonna have a kind of awkward looking situation Right. I mean, e even if cars don't get parked in what is technically car parking spaces, it, it's it's not necessarily going to be in the interest of the current property owner to keep those spaces looking nice and consistent with the rest of the park. And we can't force that to happen. Right. Because th it's their property. That's correct. Yes. Okay. Um, w would I also be correct in assuming or not assuming, that there's actually a. Uh, improvement of public safety component here too, in in that we're taking away a potential risk factor for interactions between vehicles and people. Yes, I, I would agree with that. I mean, uh, let's say the property owner retained that they could, you know, be having trucks or, or even some vehicles or moving heavy equipment or, you know, even trash services. So not only I think does it create a safety issue, but an aesthetic, a very significant aesthetic issue, issue. Which is probably uh, in practice more significant than the safety one. Right? Yeah, yeah. It, it could be. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Collins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a couple questions, Al. Um, I know this is kind of a silly question, but people always ask, and how did we arrive at a half a million dollar price tag for this property? Well, the first thing that the city does in any acquisition is we do a um, property valuation. So we hire a professional appraiser, a, a licensed appraiser to do um, an appraisal of the property. So we have to do that as a public entity. And so that's what we did here. And because commercial 
uh, land values in our downtown are quite high, this is within the range of the valuation that we had prepared. Okay, and then the other question was, um, it's not really defined here in this little blue area, but can I assume that there will be a walkway that will just be a straight line that extends from where that arcade is? Um, I see city driveway, I see the uh, land, yes. but... I see what you're saying. Yeah, well, we have a uh, sort of a defined walkway that people will know that they can just continue to walk down, that there won't be tables set up there or garbage cans or, or whatever. Um, well, it, you know, it kind of depends. However, I think you bring up a really interesting uh, point. There, we have this arcade here, mm -hmm. and that's really a passageway, right, a pedestrian passageway. And currently people exit the garage, and then you have sort of a, a crossing here. Um, and so that passageway lines up directly with those, the, the area that the city is acquiring now. So you could argue that this is just an, a, a very, uh, I think from um, an urban design standpoint, um, a, just a very good uh, uh, continuation of the pedestrian passageway that goes all the way uh, really from City Hall across the Pacific Hacienda building, which, which the city uh, maintained. You can walk all the way from the dog park or the library or City Hall into downtown through these protected and, and safe passageways. So the acquisition here um, would maintain that passageway for people. Uh, you could have it go all the way through. Now you may have, uh, someday, you could potentially have a few tables and chairs out there with umbrellas. But well, I think it would yeah. maintain that, that clear pathway through. Right, and not that it has to be exactly straight. Maybe if it veered a little yeah. bit, because uh, are we gonna take out the curb? Or what are we gonna do with that? And you know, there's that sidewalk there that's above, is that gonna go? Take it off. Um, you know, I think that what we would want it to do is all be level. So the plaza should be all at the same elevation. So it would either be lowered or raised depending on the design of the plaza. So it would all be even at some point. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, is there anyone from the public wishing to speak on this item? Go ahead. Come on, Kara. Maybe we can get an answer for you. Please come up to the microphone. Thank you. Sure. Uh, I'm just wondering about the alley that runs behind Wells Fargo. Is there going to be an access or exit point? Because right now you you can enter, you know, the blue area there. You enter and then you make a left turn and you drive down to Wells Fargo. The, the blue area is going to be completely uncar, no cars there. But there's going to be an entrance. Al, you can explain it off a of cherry, and it's going to run the entire length behind Wells Fargo, right? All that. How do you get out? In other words, it's going to run. It's really going to be more for trucks than anything else because there's, I don't think there's an entrance to the parking garage. It's basically for deliveries, and it's going to be out on San Carlos Avenue. It's going to go out on San Carlos Avenue. Oh, where the little where um, the little mini mini teeny park was, yeah, oh. right, right out. That's correct. Yeah. Okay, so that little park goes away. Goes away. Okay, yeah. thank We're you. We're sort of swapping out, hopefully, a bigger plaza off of Laurel Street for the little small little little alleyway there. Yes. Uh, anyone else wishing to speak on this uh, matter? Go ahead. Please come up. Mayor, um, I just have, I get very nervous talking in front of people, That's but right. I Visualize. just have a question, Mr. Sabe. Yeah. Are we taking down the Foodville um, building? It's already been taken down years ago. Okay. Yeah. All right, well, that's kind of all I had to ask because I was very confused on how yeah, you Yeah, the Foodville building guess. disappeared about three years ago. Okay. Thanks. No problem. Okay, uh, if I don't see any other hands up there, then uh, gentlemen. Mr. Mayor, I move to adopt resolution 2018 112. 112, a resolution of the City Council of the City of San Carlos authorizing the City Manager to execute a purchase agreement to purchase a portion of real property located at 1201 to 1225 San Carlos Avenue, APN 050-132-220 in an amount of $500,000 and execute necessary documents to effectuate the purchase and appropriating $500,000 from the Strategic Property Acquisition Reserve Fund for the purchase. Second, is there a second? A second. second. All right, seconded by Mr. Johnson. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councilmember Obert? 
Yes. <clears throat> Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. And Mayor Grosselli? Yes. All right. Uh, Mayor, may I yes. add just uh, one little thing I wanted to pass along to Al that uh, came up today in a conversation with somebody. Um, when you get around to looking at designing the park parklet, um, somebody uh, had suggested that it might be nice if we could find ways to make it particularly kid friendly. So I just passed that along because it's not something I had heard before. Thank you. Okay. Uh, item 9, 9A, council member reports on subcommittees, regional boards, commissions, and committees. Mr. Olbert. Thank you, Bob. Um, uh, the only item I wanted to mention was uh, at the uh, recent CCAG meeting, the City County Association of Government meeting. Um, there was an extensive discussion about something that's going to be coming up before the public relatively soon. It's called the Managed Lane Project. It would be adding an additional lane of traffic to 101 going both northbound and southbound, basically from um, the Redwood City area all the way up to South San Francisco. Um, uh, the way it's currently conceptualized is it would be a lane usable by carpool vehicles but also it would be one of those lanes as, as is fairly common in Southern California and a growing popularity in the Bay Area where you could buy access to it through a transponder-based system. You'd pay to be able to get into a, a, a less heavily trafficked lane. Um, I don't mean to go through the, all the details on it. I actually was just going to suggest that it may be something that the council might want to have uh, a discussion about at some point in the future, the new council, because it is a fairly significant project. It's uh, basically going to be about a half billion dollar uh, project. Um, pro probably all funded from funds that are coming elsewhere, not out of local sources, or at least not most of it. Um, but clearly has a lot of impact on many communities up and down the corridor, and, and we ought to be aware of what's going on, and our community ought to be as well. Okay. Any other comments? If not, uh, Mr. Uh, City Manager, staff comments? Uh, just uh, two quick ones, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, first of all, just want to remind the community that uh, Friday, November 30th, that's this coming Friday, is our night of holiday lights downtown from 5.30 to 8.30. So hopefully if you're available and out there in the community, you'll join us uh, for a good time uh, this Friday. Uh, also, now that we've kind of officially entered the holiday season, I uh, again want to remind the community that uh, we are out in force on uh, enforcing and uh, actively hunting drunk drivers. Uh, we did have a, a DUI accident uh, over the Thanksgiving holiday weekend. Uh, fortunately, uh, there were no injuries, uh, even including the drivers. Uh, the jaws of life were deployed. It was a significant accident. Um, fortunately, it hit a uh, inanimate object as opposed to another vehicle with occupants or pedestrians in the street. Uh, this is uh, not acceptable here in San Carlos. Uh, we bring in uh, extra law enforcement this time of year, uh, and they're tasked uh, specifically uh, with looking for drunk driving. So we want you to have a good time. We want you to enjoy all your holiday parties, but please do not uh, get behind the wheel if you are intoxicated. Thank you. Okay, anything else? If not, meeting adjourned.